You are listening to Scott H. Silverman's Happy Hour, a podcast released on the first three Wednesdays of the month. Family crisis, relationship crisis, addiction crisis, no two crisis situations are the same. They vary by family, individual, and relationship. They can encompass complex family dynamics, emotional distress, anger issues, and entitlements, and often involve substance abuse. This podcast addresses these issues and others surrounding the addiction epidemic currently plaguing this country and the world. There is hope and help. Are you stuck, scared, or unsure of what to do next? If a situation with a loved one, spouse, or even a child has started to spiral, possibly becoming dangerous or threatening, it's time to seek help. My name is Scott H. Silverman. I help families navigate crisis situations. I'm the person you turn to in order to get you and your loved ones unstuck. Welcome back to Scott H. Silverman's Happy Hour. This is Michael Glenn Moore. I'm Scott's co-host. And today we have a special guest with us again. And Scott's going to introduce, uh, introduce our guest. But before then, Scott, why don't you go ahead and read a, a review that we have on Apple iPod. Apple iPod, Apple iTunes. Okay, thanks, Michael. Oh, Apple iTunes. All I know is it's a, it's a, uh, a really positive review, and I'm going to read it anyway. I'm Scott Silverman, and welcome to uh, our happy hour, where what we're about to talk about hopefully will make you happy. If not, it'll make you think, and help you make decisions so you can get happy. All right, here it is. Uh, Silverman has a lifetime of experience with helping people manage addictions. He shares his knowledge in a clear and helpful language, and he cares deeply about his clients. Who else would give out their personal call phone number and say you can call them at any hour, any time, any day? So if you have questions for yourself, a family member, a friend, just call Scott and or Confidential Recovery in San Diego. He's the real deal. Cool. Does this review ring a bell for you, Don? I was going to say, I think I wrote that. <laughs> Our guest actually wrote that. The timing is uh, serendipitous. And what we're about to do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, but before we get started, I'd like to just take 30 seconds and ask everybody to close their eyes and just pause and think about something very positive, something very exciting, something happy. Because the way the world's going today, it seems like we have to work a lot harder to get there and we shouldn't have to. So 30 seconds for whatever you want, just to Take a breath in and out and realize. Realize that you have a choice every day. You can be happy. You can choose to be happy or not. And if you don't know how, ask for some help. So again, Scott Ed Silverman here with a happy hour. I'm going to give you my contact information. It is area code 619-993-2738, 619-993-2738. Nine nine three two seven three eight. Call me, text me anytime. Check me out at yourcrisiscoach.com or re reach us at Confidential Recovery. Uh, we are in San Diego, California, but guess what? I know how to use a phone, email, text, and social media to help you in your community. So don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Remember, three of the hardest words in the English language are, I need help. Practice that in your head, bring it to your lips, and reach out. So today, we have a um, special guest, and I'm going to tell you why I think he's special. Uh, first, he's a friend, and secondly, he's a friend, and thirdly, he's a good friend. And uh, Dr. Houts is a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist. I did some search on you in the web, and it's interesting. All they talk about is you have a practice in Cardiff or Del Mar, and you've been doing it from anywhere. I couldn't tell 21 to 41 years, and when you see him, you'll know it's only been like you know maybe 15 because he's in his late 30s. I'm, telling, I'm not telling the truth there. But, but Don and I met a few years ago, and I'm going to let him tell you how we met because he has a better memory than I do. But one of the things I know about Don is he is the kind of doctor that when you call him – actually, the one review I bet or did read about you is he responded quickly, he answered my questions, and he really helped me out. So that's what I really care about. And the people that come on our show, you know, and now I'm getting phone calls from, hey, I want to be on your podcast. They heard about you, Michael. And they go, oh, yeah, I want to get a hat like that. And I want to be on the show. And, you know, now I'm asking people to submit a little one sheet and tell us why we should pick them. I mean, it's nice to have a little momentum. And we want to bring people on the show that, you know, care about others. 
and they want to do their best to help save lives, to get involved in recovery and mental health and happiness and joy and recovery. So Don's a guy who, again, when you call him, reach out to him. And he's semi-retired now. I think he works an hour a week, but he does. <laughs> and, when he, and when he doesn't want to do something, because I remember asking him, what was it about two years ago? I said, hey, we have this client. They want to, no, I don't do that anymore. Um, but, but before he could finish his statement, he was texting me three different names of professionals who could. And that's just, you know, to me, that's stunning. To me, that's, that's just genuine and that's organic. And that's why I like Don. He's an organic guy. And I, I'd like to say, I, I like to say, I'll say, I love him like a brother. And I know I can always count on him no matter what. And we refer people to each other all the time when he's in town and he's available. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Don Houts. Don, tell us about yourself. Well, I am a psychiatrist uh, in private practice in, in the San Diego area, and I've been doing this for a bit longer than you said. Uh, I think I opened my practice in uh, 1980, so we're at 40 years. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I have a, a specialty in psychoanalysis, so. One of the first questions that comes to mind is, so what's the difference between a, a psychologist uh, and psychiatrist? And uh, the psychiatrists like me have been through medical school, so we are able uh, to prescribe medications that hasn't been available to um, other practitioners uh, in this field, uh, but, but that could be changing imminently here with new laws in California that some other people will be able to have prescribing rights. Um, but there are, you know, there are a series of degrees of, of people that, that are able to do mental health related stuff from uh, MFTs, marriage and family therapists, to LCSWs, which is a licensed clinical social worker, uh, to uh, PhDs, uh, PsyDs, and then uh, doctors. And you know, the, the, the difference in degree has to do with how many years you spent in education, but it's not the most important thing. Um, there are people who have a ton of education who I wouldn't refer anybody to because I know that they've got their own continuing troubles. And on the other hand, I've known some people with the, what you would consider to be a lesser degree, I suppose, um, that uh, are wonderful uh, in their approach to dealing with patients and are extremely helpful. So, um, that's, um, let's see, uh, I uh, finished, my, I, I did my residency at UCLA and UCSD, um, I, and, and then I matriculated to the San Diego Psychoanalytic Institute, and I was th there for six years. Um, I had, uh, uh, you know, that, that was, you know, in addition to the four years of medical school, four years of residency, and then another six years of, of uh, post-residency work. And, you know, the, are, you, the, are you trying to, are you trying to say you might be overeducated? No, I'm, okay. I, I'm certainly thoroughly educated. You know, my, thoroughly, okay. I'll go my, with that. My dad used to uh, joke about uh, his people and say, well, what's he going to be when he, when he, when he, gets finished and my dad would laugh and say oh about 30 and uh, I took him a decade more I graduated from the institute just before my 40th birthday so uh, you know it just takes a lot of years and and you know when I finished the residency I just did not feel comfortable yet being able to sit down with people although I had a full-time practice you know there was a uh, a sense of, of, you know, discomfort about listening to people tell about the most important events in their lives. Uh, and I needed a theory or a framework within which to uh, understand those things. Uh, so I could respond in a reasonable way and, 
And I just thought it was really simple to keep learning about it. So uh, there you go. That's your story and you're sticking to it. I like it. So Don, yeah. tell me, you know, you, when we first met, one of the first things you shared with me is you had a shift in your practice. Would you, yes. would you kind of go back to what triggered that and, and what sure. that shift was? And I think that's the thing that really I found fascinating because most people that I've learned in the, the medical professional world, you know, they kind of had this, like you said, they've spent a lot of time going to school, they get credentialed, they develop their practice and they're kind of on autopilot. But when you shared with me the shift that you took, it was pretty significant and how it influenced what you were doing now, uh, in my words now, differently with clients that you hadn't been able to actually either apply or put in front of you or wasn't important to you. I don't remember the exact conversation, but I was, I was pretty impressed by that. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, this, the topic here is substance abuse and, and, uh, I had a relatively late onset with regard to, uh, my own substance troubles, uh, which was primarily alcohol. And, uh, what do you mean I, by late, late onset? Meaning, uh, 40, okay. uh, not until the middle of my forties did this really, uh, become, uh, an issue. And, uh, you know, I, frankly, I didn't have time, um, you know, it. through the, through my thirties, I, uh, was, uh, studying analysis, uh, that required 30 or more hours a week. I had a full-time practice. I had three little kids and a marriage and, uh, I was devoted to all of those activities. And when I finally graduated from the Institute, uh, I had free time for the first time in my life and I didn't know what to do with all that. And I, I was tired of going to school and there was another program I could have gone to, but I said, you know, this is enough. And, uh, and, and I found myself particularly in the evenings, uh, drinking too much. And, uh, and that went on for, uh, a few years and uh, it's, you know, prior to that time, I really had not treated alcoholics as a specific part of my practice. As a, as a resident, you know, you spend time, you do a rotation through alcohol treatment programs and substance abuse treatment. And, uh, and what, when I was doing that at UCLA, I was... Uh, you know, fascinated by it, but it wasn't what grabbed me. And uh, it was when I caught myself in the midst of all of that, that I suddenly realized that I needed to know more. Um, and so... Um, so you didn't really grab it. It kind of grabbed you. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a fair statement. And I yeah, decided, I, like <laughs> I decided to hang on. The uh, So I was involved in a... a a program that doesn't exist anymore as I was an advisor to um, a group that was treating college age students um, for substance abuse. And I think it was that program that led me to meeting you. Uh, we had, there was a, a person that was the uh, manager of that program who suggested that it might be helpful for me to get to know you. Mm. And, and then, uh, can't, can't hear that enough. Can you? <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember, uh, having a lunch with you and Charlie, uh, Nelson, right. Uh, who's, uh, been, a you know, a long standing, uh, powerful figure in, in substance abuse treatment in San Diego. And I, it, turned out I had met Charlie many years before we had a, uh, a weekend together uh, that was, you know, for, with a friend who was having a 40th birthday and, and we all went river rafting together. Uh, so, uh, but I remember meeting you for the first time and then you were in the middle of forming an organization of uh, uh, professionals who treat substance abuse in this area. And so that was the, the beginning of our association. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Society of Addiction Professionals. Exactly. 
And, and the reason I wanted to do that is I wanted to meet people like you and I wanted to meet people like Charlie. And I felt, you know, cause I know, you, you know, solo practitioners who are the main driver, in my opinion of, you know, treatment for individuals in our community, unless you work in a big institution, um, you know, they're the ones who are the change agents when it comes to therapy, because they're out there hearing about it, going to conferences, not the doctors aren't they, but again, a lot of them get them autopilot. You work for institutions. You've got your, you know, you've got your footprints in the sand, your manuals and your policies and procedures. And I wanted to find a way to, you know, help more people in San Diego. Just, you know, I was seeing too many people leave our community to go get help and come back with no infrastructure and no support team and no recovery plan. And we'd see that relapse factor here in San Diego. And you and I, I talked a lot about that. How do we, how do we do something different with it? How do we, manage to help people realize that, you know, you 28 days stay is just not enough. You know, it's just like working out for a weekend once a month. You're not going to get in shape and stay in shape at one, uh, one weekend a month. So Don, tell me as you moved forward in your, um, uh, you know, trajectory, you know, or redirection, if you will, what was the one thing that you found that was uh, most telling for you? Well, um, where was your aha moment? I mean, obviously you had your own experience, but once you'd done it for a little while, what was your, uh, your aha moment once you realized that, you know, here I am, I spent all this time, I got educated. Now I've had my own experience with this issue. I'm going to, and then fill in the blanks for us. If you can, you know, I, I don't know if this is a specific answer to your question or not, but the, the thing that I remember being, um, surprised about was how loving and caring and honest the uh, substance abuse community is. Um, you know, and so part of that has to do with talking about AA. But, you know, I ran into a group of professionals who were um, more giving and more loving and honest than uh, any group that I had yet encountered. Uh, and, and I saw the value of, of what they were doing in terms of the treatment of patients. And, you know, it's a surprise because, you know, we all, uh, when we're involved in the disease, uh, are so fearful of the judgment of others when it's really our own judgment that we're running from. And uh, uh, people are uh, patient and helpful, and uh, and it, it. I was just very impressed by that. Uh, you know, as opposed to uh, uh, some of the professional organizations that I've been a part of, that uh, you know, there's uh, a certain amount of um, critique or criticism. Uh, of one's behavior that that one is that you know that's an issue so at any rate um, and, and and you know there are uh, some very bright not only caring but very bright people that are uh, involved in substance abuse and and it's 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 a place where you can have an impact uh, fairly quickly uh, and see people get better it's pretty exciting right that's a, that's so, a so, I, it. It, so it, it uh, reawakened some enthusiasm for mental health treatment that, uh, you know, hadn't been quite so intense for a while. Well, when you think about the fact that, you know, again, you're professionally trained, then you have this organic experience where uh, anecdotally and experientially now you've you've been through this journey yourself. It's, you know, it's kind of like saying, oh, you've never been to jail. You don't know what it's like. You've never been a race car driver. You don't know what it's like. You know, you've never flown a jet. You've never gone that fast, but you know, we have YouTube now, so you can, you can get any experience you want visually and audibly if you, if you want to. So tell us uh, what, what right now, you know, what is your role in the treatment of substance abuse? Because I remember we were talking one day and you said to me, I said, so, you know, what is your background? And you said, well, I've tried about what did you say? Almost 1,800 cases as a forensic psychiatrist. And I said, we mean, it, it literally had been a professional witness for 1,800 plus cases when I think we first talked. And that's a lot. So wh what's, what's your involvement with the treatment of substance abuse? And also, would you share a little bit about what a forensic psychiatrist is? Because that's a, those two terms put together probably escape most people as a logic way of what, what it really means. 
Well, forensic just means the law. And it, and it, so a forensic psychiatrist is someone who offers opinions uh, within some legal setting. And uh, so I've now uh, retired from the uh, forensic aspect of my practice, which ended with about 2,000 cases. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it, Put my kids through graduate school, so you know it was a, it was a, a good thing in that regard. But um, you know, so at my role in treating alcoholism today is you know there is a number of, of places that uh, a, a professional can jump into this treatment modality. Uh, a lot of people are involved in the very early phase, helping people just get sober. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in, uh, from uh, psychiatry, there may be uh, medications that are helpful uh, for uh, people at that stage. And, um, but my role is typically a little bit later in the process after somebody's gotten through the shock of early sobriety, you know, the, the uh, gotten used to the idea that alcohol is not their best friend uh, and they've mourned the, uh, the loss of that. Um, there's a, a time when, and they're beginning to uh, appreciate the importance of rigorous honesty, uh, which is critical to and and you know most i mean frankly most people that are substance abusers you know at the beginning they're liars uh, that's almost synonymous with the uh, disease and so it's when someone gets used to uh, some of that and i think they understand um, that being truthful with themselves is crucial that i find a way in i see when people have been drinking for a long time, uh, their emotional development tends to be arrested at the time their substance abuse began. Uh, and so it becomes the goal of treatment to bring them up to speed. Uh, and maybe that's a 30 year, 40 year process, depending on how long they've been uh, drinking or abusing and, and uh, uh, so in my role as a psychoanalyst, I think I'm uh, adept at helping people. In, in AA, they refer to uh, character defects. Well, um, in my language, I think about uh, personality uh, disorders, uh, personality problems that uh, people can learn to change. And without alcohol in the way, uh, they're able to do that. But they also then have to get used to dealing with their own feelings, whether it's anger or frustration or uh, anxiety or happiness for that matter. Uh, they're feelings that have been muted uh, by the uh, anesthetizing of, of their bodies and minds. And, and so, uh, you know, I'm able to um, help people move to um, a higher plane, if you will, in terms of their um, uh, behavior in the world that they live in. Speaking of, um... Alcoholics Anonymous AA. Uh, what are what are your thoughts about it? You know, and I know that I get in trouble whenever I talk about it publicly because the principles are, you know, uh, it is an anonymous program. It is an abstinence based program. But I, you know, my personal opinion before you share yours is I think this anonymity thing is powerful and important. But I also think in some ways it's kind of kept the stigma, the clandestine disclosure piece. Uh, in many ways camouflage and i'm not suggesting anything other than sharing my thoughts and feelings around that because you said you know i believe families ask me all the time you know i said they're the, the anybody who's actively in their use and abuse self-medicating their three skill sets are lying cheating and manipulating and you know when you talk about you know learning how to tell the truth when you talk to somebody who's been lying cheating manipulating for a long period of time 
and you say to them, you must learn how to tell the truth, there's a real disconnect. They don't have the tools, you know, and you wonder why does it take so long? Well, because they don't know. We, we, I don't know. I did not know. I mean, I was trying to hide my disease. I didn't want people to know that, you know, I was doing a few grams of cocaine before lunch and drinking every night and smoking dope and so on and so forth. So if, when people ask me, I would say, I don't know what you're talking about. So back to AA. So what, tell us, yeah, and there's a lot of different anonymous programs out there and there's other programs that aren't necessarily, um, you know, traditionally like one anonymous program or the other and there's smart recovery and there's Buddhism and, you know, my people, the Jewish people, we have their, our own crafted 12 steps. So, and there's been spinoffs from Narcon, you know, Narcon, Narcotics Anonymous and others. So what is your thoughts about AA? Well, I think there's a lot of good news and some bad news. Um, you know, when this organization was created in 1935 and then the uh, big book of AA came, was published in 1939, uh, it really filled a void um, throughout the world. And it was pretty quickly that AA uh, began uh, happening. It spread in uh, across the United States. It went, it, you know, it's now a multinational uh, program. You, you can't go almost anywhere in the world without AA being available. And one of the stories I tell is that my daughter was um, in uh, the Peace Corps and she was living in a rural village in Paraguay. Uh, of about a thousand people. I mean, this was a long way from the capital. And uh, uh, so I was early in sobriety when I was traveling down to see her. And I was a little worried about having such a long tether uh, to my home group. And uh, so I called AA International. And, and now in, in, in Paraguay, uh, the first language is called Guarani. The second language is Spanish. And I was able to find a Spanish speaking person who, who lived in her village. Uh, and I, I thought that was remarkable. And then I knew where there was an English uh, speaking meeting uh, an hour away. I felt comforted by the fact that resources were there. Uh, as a part of that same trip, I even, um, uh, went to Ushuaia, Argentina, which is the, if you were going to go to Antarctica, you would go to Ushuaia. And uh, I found uh, an AA expat group there. Amazing to me. Wow. Uh, it's the most southernmost city in the world, and there's, there's AA. So that's the, and, and again, the group is remarkably accepting. Um, I think the the, the bad side of it for me is, is I, I don't like uh, a big part of the big book. I find that the religious aspect, the godly aspect is um, a turnoff to me. And uh, I, I, you know, now there are about 75% of um, AA members seem to be uh, associated with a, you know, a Christian Judeo uh, thought and uh, which is what this was based in. But, you know, it's a growing percentage, 20 to 25% of people uh, would identify themselves as being atheists or non-theists. And uh, so if you get into those meetings that are dominated by the more religious side it, it's uh, not helpful for me right uh, now you know we're gonna we're gonna get people who are gonna call michael and they're gonna go what's wrong with these guys i you know i full disclaimer full transparency i am a uh, product if you will of a 12 step program yeah and of aa and i've been going as a matter of fact there's there's zoom meetings now and this is what saturday i think i i went to five this week and i'm very engaged with it and actually the social model according to science um has a success rate equal to or greater than any other treatment modality 
that according to the CDC and NIDA and some of the other big organizations who have studied um, what works in treatment, one of the most stellar and it is globally uh, around. And I remember when I was in Rotary, one of the largest service clubs in the world, they used to brag about, we are all over the world. And I'd quietly in my head go, I think AA's got more meetings than Rotary and they're, they're all yeah. over the world. And as you said, anybody can walk into a meeting and just have a desire to stop drinking and they're welcomed. And Well, you know, I should clarify that I am immersed in this AA culture, primarily for myself. Um, and, uh, and that's why you feel comfortable complaining about it. No, I get it. And it's okay. No, yeah, no, I think yeah, look, yeah. You, you're speaking from experience. And I think that's important. You're not judging you. You, you cause I know that's how we met was through the, the rooms of recovery and not to, you know, break your anonymity, but, um, I probably did, but I know you've alluded to it and, you know, and you're generally pretty public about it. Cause when people hear from someone like you, and I don't mean that in any other way other than the fact that you've had the experience and you are a psychiatrist. To me, that brings a level of credibility to your conversation and to your service to help others because you have a higher level of skill set that, you know, only people who have been able to accomplish that can do. That's a compliment, by the way. It's not, Thank it's you. not, Thank it's you. not a slap. <laughs> no, I, uh, um, you know what I've, I, for me, I've just come to accept that, that, AA is the way it is. And, you know, the way that it is has been incredibly helpful. I don't know of another organization that's been as helpful uh, as AA is. So as I started off, I was saying, you know, there's lots of good things about this place and, and some other things that I, I don't like it as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, everybody in the groups that I go to and I gro go to, six groups a week on the average right. uh, that uh, know my biases about this and they still put up with me. You sure. know what, what a, it's amazing. So, you know, and it's funny thing is we're either going to get in trouble for, for busting out the fact that we belong to anonymous programs, or we're going to get in trouble because we're honest about our experience in those programs, or someone's going to critique because um, they just don't think that we should be talking about it publicly. But guess what? This is our show and we can do whatever we want. I mean, I, I was on a Zoom call yesterday. I don't want to say with who because it'll, it'll get back to them. But somebody sent me a, a private chat and said, with all due respect, you know, the, the term dope, fring, dope fiend should not be used publicly anymore. We're trying to reduce the stigma. And I personalized the comment. I said, as, an, you know, as, an, as a retired unlicensed pharmacist who was a dope fiend, I think one of the things that we need to do in our community today is start talking about how to reduce stigma, not just you need help or you're an abuser or you suffer from addiction, you know, or you're duly diagnosed because it, look, there's some science that says when you get up each week and you introduce yourself as a low life loser, you know, or, or I introduce myself as an addict alcoholic, people will tend to judge. Not only that, we're kind of giving ourselves this negative reinforcement. Again, I'm not, criticizing anything i'm just saying that there's some science out there today that says we've we've got to add something else to our overall behavioral health if it's needed meaning if someone needs medication if someone needs a higher level of help if someone needs look if you break your leg yeah you can go on youtube and you can see how to probably put a splint together but it's probably better to get to the emergency room get an x-ray and have a professional put a cast on. And then you might even need some physical therapy once you get out of your cast. And I see this disease just like diabetes, just like heart disease. Once you get it assessed and you get it arrested, there's a recovery process and a plan for life that allow you to do whatever you want to do. You just, for me, I can't put it in my body. I'm allergic to it. So Dom, we're running out of time. Argue, I Go can't on. argue with that, by the way. I know. Well I appreciate that. Yeah. When you were screened before we let you on here and, you know, we only got, <laughs> we only got you here because, you know, Charlie was here a little, a couple of weeks ago and he, he shared some of his story as well. So I have um, one, one more big question for you. And then I want you to share your contact information. Then we'll wrap up. If you had a magic wand with all the things that you've learned in your life experience and your professional career about, you know, the human mind, body, soul, and heart, what, what would you do with that magic wand?
Well, I mean, there's so much suffering that uh, you and I see uh, as people uh, deal with their substance abuse, the families that are uh, attached to that. And uh, I would like to find a way to ease some of the suffering that I see. Um, and I think that's as far as I can go with that. Well, look, I opened up with why Don Houts, why Dr. Houts? Well, you just, you just confirmed and put the bracket around and the period on the end of the sentence. So I want to thank Dr. Houts for being here with us today. This is Scott H. Silverman with Happy Hour. My number again, 619-993-2738. I'm going to throw it back to you, Michael, then we'll go back to the doctor for uh, closing affirmation. Okay. Um, I do have one question for Don. I was wondering, what would you consider your lowest point before entering recovery? Oh, the family confrontation uh, that I had. Um, we were on a vacation together and, and uh, they uh, detected my misuse and uh, confronted me about it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the confrontation was you got to clean up your act or we're done. And uh, I would say that's absolutely the bottom end of this. Yeah, that, me. Uh, almost a uh, intervention there for you, wasn't it? Well, it was an intervention. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, my Couldn't wife leave the had, room till he said, my, "Yeah, I'll do whatever you want." <laughs> my wife, uh, in her early years, worked in an alcohol treatment program, and uh, she had uh, a fair amount of power with regard to expressing her opinion about this. And uh, the good news is, I listened. Okay, Don. What we at the end of the podcast, we ask our guests to give a quote that means something to them and i believe that you have one for us today i do and this this comes from my father i after he died i didn't know that he had this on his desk he had uh found this there's a little business magazine called success unlimited i i think it still exists i'm not sure but he saw a quote that he had made into a paperweight and this sat on his desk every day uh, and it says, no one can take the ultimate weight of decision-making off your shoulders. But the more you know how about things really are, the lighter the burden will be. Mm -hmm.